And good afternoon. My name is Jeremy Benemy. I'm the president of J Street, and I'm very uh, happy to be joined on today's webinar about the Israeli protest movement uh, by Ophir Gutelson, who is one of the founders of Unacceptable, which is the organization in the United States that has been leading uh, demonstrations in support of the pro-democracy movement in Israel. Uh, so these are the uh, American-Israeli-led pro-democracy uh, activities here in the United States. We will be joined by Mika Almog, who's one of the organizers of the protest movement in Israel. And so I will uh, uh, introduce her as soon as she has uh, dialed in. I know that today's a very, very uh, busy and important day uh, for the protest movement in Israel, and she'll be calling in in the midst of, I'm sure, a lot that's going on, and uh, it'll be great to get get a full update from her. Um, so I am going to give a quick uh, overview of uh, uh, what uh, is happening, uh, a very, very uh, interesting week. I'm going to ask Ophir a couple of questions. We'll be joined by Mika, and then I'll be opening it up for questions from all of you. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, box and uh, uh, share with us your uh, questions, both for uh, J Street, uh, which is an independent uh, organization of uh, Unacceptable. Uh, so questions that you have for Unacceptable, for J Street, or uh, for the protest movement in Israel. So for about seven months now, the fate of Israel's democracy has really been hanging in the balance. Uh, the very extreme far-right coalition led by Prime Minister Netanyahu has been moving forward over the course of these seven months with an agenda uh, that is really aimed two revolutions. One is the undermining uh, of Israel's democracy internally, uh, specifically uh, aiming to undermine the independence of the Israeli judiciary, and the other revolution aimed at cementing permanent Jewish sovereignty over all of the land uh, that Israel occupied in 1967. Uh, for about 15 years, J Street has been talking about the day that Israel would reach a fork in the road when it would have to choose a path for its future. Uh, would Israel want to be and would it decide to be a healthy democracy uh, with a Jewish character uh, that lives next door to a Palestinian state, a second state, or would it choose a non-democratic one-state future? And this week, Israel is poised to take the first fateful step uh, down the road towards a non-democratic future uh, with key votes on legislation uh, planned for this coming weekend uh, that undercut the Supreme Court's ability to evaluate and overturn lawmakers' controversial decisions. Since the start of 2023, it's been incredible to watch the Israeli pro-democracy movement that has emerged uh, and has begun to organize uh, an incredible uh, hundreds of thousands of people strong mass protest and, and civil di disobedience campaign. Uh, that protest and these protests are, are continuing today, literally as we speak with significant protests all across Israel in advance of the upcoming uh, Knesset vote. And not only is the protest uh, reaching a peak now, with the legislation happening next weekend, today is the day that Israeli President uh, Isaac Herzog has arrived in Washington and he's meeting as we speak with President Biden at the White House. And tomorrow uh, he is set to address a joint session of Congress. So the uh, issues that are at the forefront of the democracy protests and that are being debated in Israel are being brought right here to Washington, D.C. And that's where we find uh, Ophir. Uh, and uh, Ophir, who is a, a native of the Bay Area, uh, but is here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and Ophir, perhaps you could tell us what exactly you're doing here in Washington, D.C., <laughs> what you've planned uh, to welcome the Israeli president to, to the nation's capital. Thanks, Jeremy, for having me uh, on this call. Uh, and thank you, everyone who joined. Um, I am. Uh, I was traveling yesterday uh, uh, from Palo Alto over here uh, uh, to actually uh, um, uh, welcome President Herzog uh, to the White to the White House and to the to the speech on the Congress, uh, and also reaffirm uh, the risk to the Israeli democracy. So we are going to have a rally. We're actually having a rally outside of my car here, just in the White House. We can walk there later, um, and there is a rally tomorrow, 9 a.m. on U.S. Capitol. 
uh, before the speech to basically uh, welcome Mr. Uh, the President Herzog and reaffirm the risk and the rally for pro-democracy in Israel. Terrific, and J Street is uh, excited to be joining you uh, tomorrow morning. I'll be there myself at 9 a.m. and uh, then a, a few of us are going inside to, to hear the president's speech. And uh, I think it's it's gonna be a very interesting uh, interesting day in the US-Israel relationship. So yep. tell us a little bit, if, if you don't mind, uh, just give people a little bit of uh, the basic 101 uh, as to what is happening this week in the Knesset? What is the specific law that is now being considered for passage next Sunday? And how does it relate to the broader package of legislation that was proposed earlier in the year and that seemed to be on hold for a while? Yeah. So um, as you all probably know, I mean, like uh, four days after the coalition started to uh, uh, came to, to reality in January, uh, 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 Justice Minister uh, Yariv Levin announced like a list of uh, changes to the judicial reform, he called it. Um, and uh, very quickly, a lot of uh, uh, scholars, academia, high tech people figured out this is not a judicial reform. This is a blitz of laws uh, that would turn, uh, basically will become a revolution in the way uh, it will be a judicial overhaul. It will reduce, it basically will take away the judicial independence and give all the power to the executive branch. Uh, thanks to the protest movement and a lot of efforts from many uh, on the streets uh, from and people outside of Israel and people on the academia, high tech professors, we were able to stop the blitz and the, and the, and the winter session, or it was a spring session, no, it was a winter session. We are now in the spring session. Uh, and the, Ophir, your audio just cut out. It, it, or else my audio just cut out. Uh, better? That Now oh. it is better, yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, where did you lose me? Uh, you were just about 30 seconds into it. Okay, so the judicial, we were able to block the judicial uh, over, over the blitz back then. Uh, but as soon as uh, the spring uh, uh, session started, instead of like bringing the blitz uh, uh, all over again, the government decided to take the piecemeal or the way we call it the salami way. Um, and uh, one, one important law that can basically change everything is called the uh, reason, reason, reasonableness doctrine. Reasonableness doctrine. And the reasonable doctrine is basically the basis for the for everything that is happening in the government to be uh, in some way overlooked by the by 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 the courts. For example, if uh, Mr. Netanyahu decide to uh, uh, appoint his son to be uh, the foreign minister, is it reasonable? It's not reasonable, right? But with a new law, it would not it would be it would not be able to actually go to court and be reviewed. Now, again, most of those. Most the court is maybe changing anything in the what the, what the Knesset is doing maybe once a year on average, but because the reasonable doctrine is actually exist, most of the decisions that are made are made reasonable in a reasonable way. So it's uh, uh, going to pass uh, based on what we see right now. Uh, this will be a very quick uh, way to turn Israel into a dictatorship, uh, in the sense that. There will be almost no overlook um, on on the government, on decisions, and other other stuff, um, and that's happening as we speak. Um, and the people are on the street uh, protesting. That I, I can see Mika just came probably from somewhere in the street, uh, on the streets, um, and we are trying to do whatever we can from here. Terrific, thank you, Ophir and Mika. It's good to see you. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, yeah, that, hi, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, can you hear me? We, we hear you, and it's it's great to see okay. you as well, and uh, just a quick introduction, uh, since yeah. we waited for you to join before introducing you. Uh, for those who don't know, Mika Almog is an Israeli writer and activist. Uh, she should be well known to J Street uh, members, because she was a keynote speaker at one of our conferences, and she's been on a number of our webinars, but uh, 
it, it's great to see her. She is a very powerful voice, a leading critic of the prime minister's uh, agenda of the current uh, uh, government. Um, she also happens to be the granddaughter of the late Shimon Perez and has a wonderful legacy uh, that ties her to the founding of the nation and to the values on which it was founded. And so it's a just an honor and a pleasure as always to be to be with you, Mika. And uh, Ophir has been giving us a little bit of a 101, the basic background on what is uh, being considered this week by the Knesset, the reasonableness uh, clause and how it uh, ties in uh, to the larger package of the undercutting of democracy. I, I know we're going to have a lot of questions from people. I already see a question that I'd like to pose to you, uh, Mika, which is many uh, societies, uh, many democracies have uh, a, uh, a process in which judges are chosen uh, by uh, the legislature, uh, by, by uh, the majority in the legislature. Many uh, societies don't have this kind of judicial review over administrative decisions. Why is it that this, in the view of the protest movement, uh, is such a critical set of changes. What is at stake and why is it that we believe that democracy itself is at risk if these kinds of proposals move forward? Okay, well, thank you, first of all. Uh, good evening and my apologies for my uh, tardiness. Um, I actually uh, left a march when I realized I had lost a track of time. Just so you have an idea of what life is like right now, uh, 6.30 in the morning, I was at Habima in Tel Aviv, and then we marched over to the stock market in Tel Aviv, and from there we marched over to the Histadrut building, what would be the word for that, the, uh, the, union, the, uh, the, the unions, the, the head of the unions, and we, and we protested there, and um, hang on. Sorry, I have calls coming in. And, uh, and now um, I marched, we went to, we protested uh, just outside the American uh, embassy. And now everyone is marching over to Roca, which is a big junction and from there to Kaplan. And there's also a march leaving tonight from Kaplan to go to Jerusalem on foot. So the plan is for people to start marching tonight and arrive at the Knesset in four days, uh, marching about 10 kilometers per day. Uh, and Sunday morning, they're going to vote on the, uh, on the reasonableness uh, clause, um, wh in which I will address in a moment. But that's, we, we really are at a boiling point, and people are waking up. And, and well, we've been awake for a while now, but realizing that we can't wait for the next step to happen. Now, in response to your question, one of the manipulations that uh, Bibi and the coalition has been, uh, has been using is this idea that there's nothing wrong with judges being elected by politicians because it's that way in many other democracies in the world. And what you need to understand is that that explanation is, uh, is cherry picking, okay? It picks one aspect whilst ignoring every other aspect. So in the US, uh, judges are indeed elected by politicians. However, in the U.S., uh, the president is elected separately from Congress. It's a bicameral system. There's a, there's a constitution. There's a bill of rights. Uh, it's a federal system. And each and every one of these things are checks and balances. So that the fact that uh, uh, judges are elected by politicians, there are many ways to keep that in check and make sure that it doesn't uh, nullify the legal system. Israel has none of these checks and balances, not one of them, okay? The, the, our, our prime minister is not elected separately from his, uh, from his party. Uh, we do not have a bicameral system. We do not have the Bill of Rights. We do not have a constitution, nor do we have, you know, I could over, go over the legal systems in France and in other places. Uh, the Israeli public is entirely defenseless. Uh, without an independent Supreme Court. Because the other thing that's important to understand about the system in Israel, and my, apologize to, my apologies to those who already fully understand that, is that um, in Israel, the prime minister is in charge of the executive branch directly. I apologize for the noise. Um, the prime minister is, is, uh, is responsible for the executive branch. And because the prime minister is the head of the coalition, he is also um, in charge of the, uh, um, um, oh, what's the word I'm missing? 
not the judicial, there's the executive, the, the legislative, okay? So he's, so via the coalition and the Knesset, he is also in charge of the legislative branch. So that's two of them, executive and legislative. And what he, what the coalition is attempting to do now is to actually get the coalition and the prime minister in essence to also control the judicial branch. And that means that rather than having three branches of government, we will have one. And that obviously is the very definition of, of dictatorship. Now, the, the, uh, the unreasonable, the reasonableness clause um, is allows the, the Supreme Court in very extreme cases to overrule a law voted in by the Knesset if it deems it unreasonable. Now, the Israeli legal system has passed more than a thousand laws in our 75 years in existence. And I, uh, I invite you to unmute yourself and guess how many times the reasonableness clause has been put into action. Go, go, go. We're timing this. We're timing this, people. Where I already gave him the answer before, Mika. Oh, you see, that's what you get for being late. <laughs> ha ha. Never be late to class. You will miss important things. Okay. So obviously, Ophiel already said everything that matters. So yeah, 22 times. Which, and, you know, if we were to go into the specifics of these 22 times, one of the examples is when there was a, a call to uh, um, uh, to put in, you know, bomb shelters for, for schools in Sderot. And for whatever reasons, political and whatever, the government wouldn't do it. And so the Supreme Court stepped in and said, people living in Sderot are shelled and bombed all the time. This is an unreasonable decision made by the government. So even if you break down these 22 times, they're not political. And so the, the bottom line is that if you want the, the reasonableness clause canceled so badly, it's because you know you are about to do something that is very unreasonable, okay? For example, uh, appoint Ali Adili, the leader of the, uh, the ultra-religious uh, Shas party, who has been uh, convicted of taking bribes and of evading his taxes uh, twice. And he is now Netanyahu's uh, a candidate for minister of finance, okay? Which if it were not so dangerous and horrible would have been kind of funny and ironic because you know, would you as Americans ever put a convicted felon in charge of your taxpayer's money? And for that matter, would you accept a, a convicted felon who was twice in jail uh, for, you know, uh, um, felonies having to do with, with money, would you want him in charge of American funds that get to Israel in the form of American grants? Because that's going to happen too. You know, this is, the thief is going to be in charge of the money. It's insane. That's an unreasonable choice. The, unreason the reasonableness clause would block it. So the attempt to remove the reasonableness clause has to do with the desire to do highly unreasonable things. Um, and of course, it would also serve Netanyahu as the get out of jail card to wiggle his way out of, uh, of the trial he's currently on. Thank you I'm, for that. I'm overview. taking the pause for the and, uh, th Thank you for, for that overview. Ophir, um, could you also uh, give us a little bit of a sense of what you are hoping uh, here in the United States that organizing here uh, will do to help the protest movement there? Uh, what kinds of audiences are you seeking to reach? What are the impacts that you're hoping to have by your work here in the United States? So we have uh, basically had uh, two or three main uh, uh, goals. Like, first of all, it's giving a lot of tailwind to the protest movement in Israel to know that they are not alone, right? So coming out in solidarity is super, super important. Uh, and we are doing it uh, now in over 25 cities around the country, uh, almost every week. So you can find us uh, the map or uh, where you can join. But the other thing is, I think that what we are doing is we're giving a stage for people who understand the risk to the Jewish homeland uh, and the risk to democracy and the idea that uh, a, a Jewish and democratic state will not be able to exist as, as, a, as a theocratic uh, uh, orthodox uh, messiah uh, country, it will be actually also very risky to Jewish Americans and Jewish diaspora in general. Um, and so we give a stage. We give a stage for people who want to come and talk and, and, and get the sense that it's okay to uh, uh, criticize this extreme right-wing uh, government um, and stand 
up for the Israeli democracy. Um, so, and that, that's the second thing. And, and the third thing is, I mean, together, together with Mika and with other organizations like USA for Democracy and with other organizations that actually in Europe, we, uh, I mean, the, the, we are trying to um, mitigate the content as fast as we can outside of the news cycle, right? Um, to everyone here. Uh, because again, you, 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 I mean, sometimes you hear things happening in Israel really quickly. Sometimes you are trying, you see, you hear it from the, uh, from the shofar of uh, uh, Bibi Netanyahu announcements, which you know, we know how good he speaks in English and how easy it is for him to say whatever he wants to say. Uh, we just saw it yesterday about the invitation. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so we're trying to uh, make it as short as possible. So the, the, the cycle of news coming and um, that, that's the three things we're really trying to do uh, here. And, and Mika, what do you think the impact is in Israel when Americans, Jewish Americans, friends of Israel are speaking up here in opposition to what is being proposed by the government? Does it have an impact? Is it uh, affecting yeah. anybody in the Knesset? Is it providing support to your movement? Uh, what, how do you look at the voices coming from the United States? Um, I, I would say one could not uh, underestimate the significance of it, uh, both for for morale, okay, uh, the sense, um, both for, mor oh, sorry, I constantly have messages coming in. Um, yeah, I should do that, okay. Um, <laughs> I would say, you know, you, you really you really can't underestimate the significance of it, both for morale and for the sense, because we know that uh, that we have no other choice than than to win this battle. OK, it's a battle for our lives. It's a battle for our future. And we're also very much aware that this is not an internal Israeli matter. This is a, a battle regarding the future of the entire Jewish people and the next, you know, the next page in our history books. And so. Um, you know, when when we get that kind of support from American Jews, this increases the chances of us winning the fight because our chances of winning this fight have to do with multiple fronts acting simultaneously. This is true both in Israel. The big demonstrations are important. We do small demonstrations such as wake up calls, you know, almost every morning at 7 a.m. I'm at someone's outside someone's house, some government minister's house, waking them up at 6 30, 7 a.m putting our pressure on, on them. Uh, of course, political actions behind the scenes and so on. Of course, a very, very significant uh, uh, movement made by uh, reserve soldiers in the IDF saying that they will not uh, volunteer for reserve service if, if Israel ceases to be a democracy. So all of these things add up. There is never going to be one thing that will keep us from becoming a dictatorship. It will forever be a collage of things, uh, a, a cooperation between a lot of people and a lot of different efforts. And so, and part of that is certainly international pressure and more significant than any other kind of international pressure is American pressure, uh, both obviously because of America's, you know, the US is standing in the world and also because of the very significant uh, unique relationship between the two countries, which is currently being trashed but many of us still value it greatly and understand its significance and would like to continue it. And I will add one more thing. Uh, I mean, that's as far as the effect goes on, on us here in Israel. On the side of the demonstrators, I think it's hugely significant. Um, and on, on the side of, of, um, of the government, I think the pressure is of huge significance. Pressure coming, you know, the, the, the chain of pressure coming from Jewish communities to the press, to, uh, to you know, uh, um, various people in government and so on. So it's significant from every single angle. And I will add one more thing in my long response to this question, which is that this is also part of a global fight against autocracy. And one of Israel's advantages is that it's a lab state, okay? Um, and, you know, you could compare it, for example, to the COVID vaccine. Israel was the first place uh, to have the COVID uh, vaccine. Uh, dispensed, uh, and it was it was a very effective testing ground because we have uh, effective means of distribution and because it's a small country. And in that sense, uh, the pro democracy public has really had six months of of boot training. Okay, 
we are so much better at this now than we were six months ago. We're highly organized. We're highly effective. There's massive cooperation. I mean, in addition to winning this battle, we are also building a camp. In, in building a camp in a fashion that has not happened in Israel in many, many decades, a liberal democratic camp cooperating uh, despite various differences, you know, overcoming disagreements and so on and so forth. And so um, I think that, you know, I, that the world is watching us. And I think that's another good reason to support our, our struggle, because I think if we can bring this anti-democratic corrupt uh, government down in, in Israel, it will also strengthen the global fight against extremism and autocracy. And, and I will just add on top of that. I mean, I mean, I'm encourage you to look for a, a document called Autocratic Legalism by uh, Kim Shapley. And this is uh, basically a, a, a one-on-one description of how to turn democracy into uh, autocracy by changing the law. It happened in Hungary, it happened in Poland, it happened in Venezuela, in Turkey, in Russia. And the whole goal is basically to confuse the people by changing just something simple. Like we talk about right now, the doctrine, the, the reasonableness doctrine, right? And that's actually changed the structure of the, of the, of the core, the structure of other things. Um, so I really encourage, and, and this could happen anywhere in the world. And as, as Mika said, I mean, like we are a, a great uh, test case to basically go and uh, 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 stop this virus from spreading in the world. So uh, there are a lot of questions that are being asked in our Q&A, and I want to try to synthesize a few of them uh, and, and direct them to the appropriate person. So Ophir, there's a number of questions about um, American Jewish organizations and whether or not you are seeing uh, some of the major ones begin to speak out more than they have up to this point uh, about the threats to democracy and, and, to, and to raise their voices. And are you satisfied <clears throat> where the American Jewish establishment and its leaders are at and what would you like to see them do? And at the same time, the question about Biden, a lot of questions about his invitation to Bibi to meet, uh, what exactly happened yesterday, uh, anything that you can say related to the idea uh, that the president uh, of the United States should or should not uh, meet or invite uh, the prime minister uh, to the White House or meet him elsewhere. Those two topics, I think, are a number of the questions in the chat. Okay, um, so a uh, couple of things. Uh, let me start with uh, the first one, which was, I lost track. So the uh, major Jewish organization. The major Jewish organization. So, so, what we, so what what we see is, I mean, many Jewish organizations were kind of like, uh, hoping that President Herzog will succeed in, uh, um, in, in, the, uh, in his negotiation uh, to come up to a very uh, large uh, consensus, which obviously, uh, uh, even though he tried really hard, failed for now. And, uh, and I think that they, are, they will have to come up with a new <clears throat> plan of how to look into this situation. Uh, what we see practically on the ground is that more and more organizations are inviting are willing to listen, are willing to bring uh, people that, are, are, and, and more and more people understand that this is not right and left issue. This is a democracy uh, basic one-on-one -on -one issue. And the same way uh, uh, people were fighting for democracy in the previous uh, administration, um, they understand they need to go and fight for democracy anywhere and anywhere, is, especially in Israel. So that's one. So we see more organization understanding that, uh, inviting us to speak, inviting others to speak, uh, and by the way, if you want to reach out to us and invite, there is a lot of people now traveling from Israel because of the vacation, and we can set up uh, house meetings or synagogues meeting congregation, like just let us know. Uh, next one is, what was the next one, Jeremy? The whole question Biden. of Biden and BB and the invitation yeah. and where do things stand? Again, I mean, so so listen, this, this has been like, what, 180 days, more than 180 days that, that Biden did not invite BB. President Biden did not invite Bibi. Um, and yesterday we heard about some, Bibi was coming up with one statement, which we now know that this was like, like one of those other things that you can never really believe what he's saying. And again, they're maybe going to meet around the United Nations meeting in September, not, not clear about that. Um, but th the reality is that as long as Israel is on the track to, the, to dictatorship, 
personally, I don't think that that uh, uh, President Biden should. Uh, I mean, if 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 there is a pressure, that's one of the pressure. We know that uh, we know that Bibi is trying to dig any tunnel he possibly can to find the invitation. So I, I think it's a good pressure to have. Again, this is not a pressure against Israel as a state. This is a pressure against the government and in, and as very right-wing, extreme right-wing uh, uh, government that we had with a lot of convicted felons running their government and extremists. And I'll just use the, that opportunity, Ophir, to build on what you said. Uh, there's a number of questions that were in the chat about uh, Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal and her comment about Israel and, and whether or not it is a racist uh, state and her clarification that she didn't mean that Israel itself is racist, but that the policies and actions of the government are at times racist. And I think that that's an important distinction that these are not protests against Israel. Uh, these are not, uh, these are pro-Israel protests, right? We, we, were standing, we were standing in front of the Israeli consulate last week on uh, like a less than 24 hours announcement when there was a sync pro a protest between Israel and the US. There were 15, cities in the U.S. together with uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Caesarea. I don't think that the Israeli consulate has so, so many Israeli flags <laughs> any time. And this is what shows you, this is like a pro-Israeli, pro-democracy. Uh, you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, con confuse this, pro this protest as a pro-Israeli, pro-democracy Israeli protest uh, that, that is criticizing the way the government is using. And again, I mean, like, I'll just give you an example. Our finance minister who called to wipe Hawara, or uh, who uh, I think he's, he, I don't know, he or his wife, uh, Smotrich, yeah, he or his wife was saying like, I don't want to be in the same uh, uh, labor. Uh, Maternity war, with, yeah. yeah. Maternity uh, so, so again, Arab. so this is the government. This is the government, this is not Israel. So uh, I'm gonna, you, I'm gonna ju up, jump in if I may. Yeah. Um, oh, sure, go ahead, go ahead. L let me ask you though, as, as you jump in, to address the, the elephant in the room, right? The, the number one issue for J Street, the number one issue being raised in the chat, uh, which is how does this all relate to the occupation? How, how does the anti-occupation message get woven into a pro-democracy message so that it's understood by people that these issues are not separable, uh, that they are one, part of the same challenge to the nature of the state of Israel. So I know you have some thoughts on that, Mika, and I know that's of huge interest to the J Street community. So I'd love to hear your take on it. Terrific. Um, let me let me just, uh, just you know, backtrack very quickly and say, A, uh, there's only one thing that BB wants out of a meeting with President Biden. Um, and the one thing that he wants is a photo op. Once he has a picture of him with Biden dated 2023, that's all the legitimization he needs, okay? At that point, he will misrepresent what happened in the meeting just in the way that he had no hesitation to you know, promote the fact that he was gonna meet Biden even though that wasn't true. Um, and the other thing that I, that I wanna briefly address is to say that I think what you're pointing out, the difference between supporting Israel and supporting its government is one of our, of our biggest challenges when it comes to Jews to world Jewry, because that is a paradigm shift. Because for most of Israel's existence, to support Israel meant to support its government. Um, and, and, you know, theoretically, that ought to be the case, right? And the problem with this government is not that it's a right-wing government, okay? Israel has had many right-wing wing governments, some of which I thought were very problematic, even destructive. But you know, <clears throat> the fact that I dislike a certain government or that it doesn't reflect my political opinions is not a reason to, to oust it um, in the matter that I'm pushing to do now. So this is not about this being a right, even extreme, very right-wing government. This is about it being an anti-democratic government, a democratically elected government that's gutting Israeli democracy. Um, as far as the question of the occupation, A, uh, the the uh, the cancellation of the reasonableness clause and uh, and uh, and you know our whole uh, uh, falling into dictatorship is of course the worst news possible as far as the occupation goes and uh, and this is yet another reason for Biden to not meet BB and not legitimize him 
because once because that's um uh, that's the deterrence, okay? That's the leverage. This meeting is, is, is a huge piece of leverage that the U.S. has over Bibi and his government. And once he gets that picture, the leverage is in, in many ways gone, and, and, and he will move ahead with the judicial coup, and eventually he will, uh, he will annex the West Bank, okay? He will build more and more and more uh, uh, settlements, he will create, uh, I mean, th this, uh, this government is already creating a, a de jour, de facto annexation, okay? But, but this will make it official, and this will really kill any hope of a peace process, of ending the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, of reaching a two-state solution, um, because, you know, this is, is a government that doesn't really have any faith in that. And that very much believes that Israel is doomed to forever live on our sword because everybody hates us and we're in a bad neighborhood. And of course, this disregards our uh, peace agreement with Egypt and our peace agreement with Jordan, one of which is, you know, almost 50 years, one of which is going on 30, you know, the other is going on 30 years. And, and you know, these were our bitter enemies too. Much, a lot of Israeli blood was, 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 uh, um, spilled in, in wars with Egypt and Jordan. So, you know, the idea that then something is impossible is, is reprehensible to me. I personally think all of human advancement is about solving problems that have no solution. Okay, so I don't accept that as an idea, but certainly the more uh, facts on the ground that are created, the more settlements there are, the more impossible it becomes to create uh, a territorial continuation in the West Bank and so on, and of course, annexation is very bad news. It's also troublesome in terms of the struggle because this is a very, very um, heated, very uh, touchy subject. A lot of the people who are part of the pro-democracy public and who are very invested uh, in this struggle uh, have uh, uh, difficult feelings about how to approach the issue of occupation, both within the struggle and as far um, as uh, as solving it goes, and I will say that this is part of the very tangible damage done by BB's 15 year rule, in which um, the whole issue of the uh, uh, a peace process, the Jewish Palestinian conflict, hasn't just been degraded, it's been removed from the table. You know, I, I have three kids, they're 18, 16, and 12 and a half. When I was a, a child and an adolescent, there was a peace process going on. And sometimes it did better, sometimes it did worse. Some people supported it, some people were against it, but its very existence, it was in conversation. And the very fact that there was a process going on meant that our country aspired to someday solve this conflict, to someday live in peace with our neighbors and so on. And so, you know, I think that the damage done uh, um, by the removal of this topic from the table entirely has indeed seeped into the uh, uh, Democrat, the liberal democratic camp as well. Um, one of the windows I see, which is which is not a simple one, but you know, a lot of Israelis have also lived feeling that the occupation has nothing to do with them. Okay. Because it's very easy to live, you know, 45 minutes away from where atrocities are happen happening and human tragedies are happening every single day, and uh, and live your life and live a nice life, you know, and go on vacation and raise your kids and so on. And 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 when your government tells you this has nothing to do with you, it's even easier to believe, uh, you know. And and this is setting aside, of course, the the whole. Um, uh, humane, moral aspect of it, okay? But I think one of the things happening now is that, and, and this, you know, has been, um, uh, I think, obvious to a lot of people for a long time, but there's, if there's a minority, if there's one group of people whose, whose human rights are negotiable, then eventually human rights are negotiable for everyone. So, you know, if Palestinians' human rights have been negotiable for a long time, then now along comes a more extreme government. And of course, the first to be targeted are you know women and minorities, okay? Because because that that's how it goes, right? The Palestinians and then the Arabs and then the gays and the women who are not a minority but are also uh, in some ways a more vulnerable part of society. So um, I think that's uh, that's one of the connections that can be made. Uh, but it's still a huge challenge, a huge challenge. And Ophir, what do you see here in the United States? You know, I know that that's also it's not just a controversial question for the protest movement in Israel. It's also a 
difficult question for unacceptable. Uh, how, how do you deal with the, the, you know, there are definitely people in your community that would like to see more attention paid to occupation. Those who would say less occupation. Yeah. Well, how do yeah. you deal with that? So, so we, we have a very uh, uh, easy, I mean, like in a way, easy answer to that. I mean, like we are accepting to the rally anyone who cares about Jewish and democratic state and whatever reason. I mean, again, listen, I mean, the, 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 the the uh, risk to rights are the risk to rights to women, which I see as uh, a red shirt, I think, the, it's, to LGBTQ, right? To, uh, 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 to, the, to the human rights of Palestinians. I mean, there is many people and, 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 and reasons to fight the judicial coup. So again, uh, what we are, our rally is about, is about protecting Israeli democracy. And you can come from whatever reason you want, right? Uh, if it's a, if if the reason that you you're afraid of of it is because uh, uh, you think that Israel is not a perfect democracy with occupation, you are welcome, right? I mean, like again, I mean, like I keep saying, I mean, like we I, I live in the United States for the last uh, what uh, almost like eleven years now. I mean, this is we we see here it's not also a perfect democracy, right? There is a lot of things that are wrong here. Right, I, I noticed. Uh, again, for many years, you didn't have our, I mean, we didn't have uh, uh, women rights, uh, LGBTQ rights. So there is always better democracy in the future for everyone, right? And, and that's, and in order to get there, we must stop the judicial coup. So everyone is welcomed. Uh, it's a big tent. I mean, we have seen uh, reform, conservatives, uh, people who can, who are, who were APAC supporter and JSTUT supporters and uh, uh, from any, any side of the map, Everyone is welcome um, with the hope to actually uh, preserve the, the Jewish and democratic state uh, based on the independence uh, uh, um, uh, foundation of, of Israel. And let yeah. me just add that while, while, while this is a, a, uh, a, a difficult issue within the struggle and there have been you know, moments, this is, again, we've overcome it. When I say we, I mean all of the organizations you know, and at the end of the day, when you come to Kaplan, there are people who say no democracy with occupation, and there are people who don't want to talk about occupation. But at the end of the day, it has not broken us up into camps. It has not taken us away from another one another. It has not lessened our ability to cooperate and work together. And that's why we have uh, achieved what we've achieved. And it's one of the reasons that I am entirely optimistic about us winning this battle. So that's a question that I think is also running through the Q&A, which is, what does winning look like? How, how do we get from here uh, with a 64-seat majority in the Knesset that appears poised to do what it's going to do? How do we get from here to a new election? How do we see that election going? Are the things that may be passed by this Knesset then uh, reversible? Uh, what is the way out of this problem? Uh, over the course of maybe not just the next months, but it's going to take a number of years to get out of this hole. So, Mika, what, how do you what do you see as the path out from here? Well, I mean, right now uh, the house is on fire. So, you know, while the house is on fire, the first thing you need to do is put out the fire. Uh, nonetheless, there's no doubt uh, that you also need to simultaneously be, you know, planning how you're going to build your next house so that you do not remain without a, a roof over your head. So I, uh, so first of all, this is a government that needs to come down. You, you can't negotiate with them because the negotiations are not in good faith. Um, you, know, I, you, know, you asked about the negotiation at the, at the, with Bougie, with uh, President Herzog earlier. And you know, I think it was a good idea to go into that negotiation so that we would not be accused of, of not even giving it a shot. But it's been clear from day one, plus our experience of the past 15 years, that the, 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 there's no good faith here. There are no real intention to come to understanding. It's a lie on top of a lie on top of a lie. So this is a government that needs to be toppled. And by the way, if you look at, uh, at recent polls, they're, they're gone in polls, okay? They have 51 uh, mandates in, in most of the polls recently. Uh, which, which would mean that, that the center left side of the map could theoretically, again, again, these are polls that my grandfather famously compared to perfume, nice to smell, <laughs> bad to swallow, okay? Um, so these are just polls, but again, according to them, theoretically right now, the center left could put together a coalition 
even without the Arab uh, uh, party, uh, which I absolutely think should be part of the coalition, but regardless. OK, uh, so first of all, we need to bring down this government and then we need to put together uh, a, a sane co you know, coalition. I mean, wh where we're at right now is that, you know, I do not aspire to the government of my dreams. OK, I first of all aspire for it to not be the government that nightmares are made, of, uh, which is what we have right now. So the first thing we need is a democratic government. OK, one that follows the rule of law, one that is not you know, trying to turn us into a dictatorship. Um, and aside from that, I think that that one of the most, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, one of the most significant things that have happened over the past six months is the building of a, of a liberal democratic camp. So I would also hope to see uh, uh, parties on the center left joining forces, okay? Whether it is actually several smaller parties coming together to be a greater force, or making various agreements that would enable them to cooperate, because you know that's what one of the problems in the, in the last uh, election was the refusal to do that. So you know I, I hope that the lesson was learned uh, as far as that goes. Um, and other than that, you know it's not a big deal. We need a new generation of uh, politicians. We need a non-toxic political environment. Uh, we need 50% women in uh, in government and in all highest offices. You know, um, and, and, and that'll, I, I, that'll I, take about a week or two after we topple the government. We'll cover the rest of it. And for the audience's sake, I think I think for again and, and just just to understand like how well is the protest movement is organized. Even in the last two or three months, there were so many wins, right? Uh, the Bar Association was right. not was actually won by the protest movement, organized and worked together. The um, the judicial committee, right? There was a, there was almost a risk for for not having an opposition government. Uh, so so there is there is many representative, representative sorry, and and the municipality elections are coming like in less than six months. So. There is there is a lot of infrastructure being built right now that would actually strengthen the liberal democrat uh, 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 camp in Israel. Uh, so again, it's not it's not and, and there is a very it's going to be a long term to make Israel democracy the democrat, democ, democratic state better. But I mean, it's the first time, as Mika said. I mean that we see wow. a lot of people, and I, and I think that just to connect it to Jewish uh, uh, Jewish American diaspora, I mean. I mean, I think that after many, many years, at least, I, again, I've, I haven't been here for many years, but what I hear is after many years, there is kind of like a, a connection between the liberal Democrats, in, uh, Jewish liberal Democrats in the US and in Israel based on the same values of Jewish and democratic, right? Uh, that we haven't seen for a long time. So that, that's an opportunity to build even a larger camp, not just within Israel, but outside of Israel. Yeah, yeah no, the, I think the municipal elections are very important also because I should also point another thing Israel doesn't have is midterm elections, okay? And we don't have the kind of local government that's very dominant in the US. Uh, and so the and and what's happened is that you know the center left camp, which which you know we fell asleep. And one of the things that happened is that municipality and local governance was also very much uh, uh, filled by people who are uh, more oriented towards the right side of the map and very oriented towards caring only for their specific uh, constituency. Uh, and so I think the understanding now that we need to put a lot of emphasis and effort into the municipal elections is also a very significant shift into a different kind of way of thinking. And, and it's and it's not just, uh, again, since we're not in a right and left wing, it's not really necessarily a right people, it's corrupted. Right, so it's a lot yeah. of a lot of jobs, a lot of uh, yeah. uh, other other stuff that is happening uh, in the municipality is driven by again, and this is going back to the reasonable reasonableness doctrine. We are going it's just a to terrible see more name. Of I know yeah. it's terrible. It's, it's terrible. a terrible name. It's a terrible name. Yeah, <laughs> if we should rename it. It should be like the make sense doctrine, you know, or yeah, it's yeah, basic doctrine. dude doctrine, you know, or just yeah. I stand so corrected. We, You're right. That's not right. Yeah. We only have a few minutes left, and I want to give you each a chance to to provide some closing thoughts for our audience. And and Ophir, I think that the question that is most common from Americans is, do we really have a right as Jews who don't live in Israel uh, to engage? And I see this in a few of the questions that are coming up in the Q and A. Um, you know, what is the 
the right of, of Americans who don't pay taxes, who don't send their kids to fight to, to express themselves on these things. I'd love your take on that. Uh, and then Mika, I guess the, the question, you know, that everybody always asks for uh, in, in America is, is hope. Uh, you know, there is a, uh, a, a dread that runs through the, uh, the Q&A, uh, but if only 28% of Israelis support uh, a two-state solution, and if there, you know, just isn't a concern about these other issues, what is the hope? And so if you could give us a little bit of the, the, the spice of hope as we close out the call, and Ophir, if you can answer the question, you know, what right uh, do Americans have to express themselves on these opinions? I think we'll sort of wrap the conversation up that way. <clears throat> okay, sounds good. So, so the way, I mean, the same question, by the way, is raised to Israeli experts. Now, yes, I was in the army. Yes, I was I have a family in Israel, et cetera, et cetera. But... And, and people would tell me like, well, you don't live in the States, uh, therefore uh, don't, don't, uh, take the, the, don't, don't wash the laundry outside. I said, Listen, I mean, I, the way I see it, Israel is, uh, is, is, was, was defined as uh, the Jewish uh, homeland. Um, and if there is a risk coming to the Jewish homeland from many reasons, then we have a say. Do I have, do, am, I, am I going to protest if the... Uh, tax will be raised on the, on bread in in Israel. No, I will not go and protest in outside of Israel, right? But if we see the risk to the future, to the values, I mean, like I see my kids growing up, they have connection to Israel, and I don't want them to be disconnected from the values that I was raised on. So that's why I'm going and protest. I mean, those are relationships that will affect. Now, the last thing I, I honestly believe that the stronger Israel will reduce, is, is the reason to, that anti-Semitism is going down. When, when Israel is going to be a theocratic dictatorship, I don't think we're going to see anti-Semitism going anywhere else. So, I mean, it will actually increase. So I, I, I think that stronger uh, Jewish and democratic state of Israel is really, really important for Jewish Americans. And therefore you have a say, I mean, like it's a mishpuche, right? And when you first, uh, when you have a problem in the mishpuche, you first go to your, close one. You don't go and look for other people. So that's my point of view on, on the reason why you do have a, a, a reason to uh, come, up, come up and stand up and speak up. Um, and, um, and again, and uh, in this note, I mean, like, again, if you're in this area, we will be, we will be out there at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And I think there is announcement on, on J Street uh, website. Thank you, Ophir. Mika, hope. Give, yeah. give, the, give, give us the, uh, the case for hope. First of all, I would say, no, you do not have a right to, to interfere in what's happening in Israel. You have a duty to do so, because this isn't just about the Israeli people. It's about the Jewish people. Um, it's really not just about Israel. If this happens, if this disaster happens to Israel, it will affect all Jews everywhere for a very long time. Um, I want to address, you, you mentioned this uh, 28, only 28 percent support uh, the two-state solution. Um, and that would lead one to think that 72% oppose it. But it's very misleading because once again, the problem or is that the, the whole issue of the two-state solution, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the peace process has been <laughs> removed from the table. And people have been told for a very, very long time by a very, very effective propaganda machine a, that they can continue to live their lives carelessly without the solution and without this problem ever being solved. Never mind the fact that our children die there and other people's children die there, but you know, that's the price you gotta pay, that's the reality of it. Um, a, and B, they've been told that we've tried and tried and tried and it's the other side's leadership, okay? So I don't think this 28% uh, uh, actually reflects the reality. Of it. OK, I think it reflects the reality of a public that has been systematically uh, disinformed and misled uh, and given a, a, a very uh, misleading perception of reality. And, and that, you know, it's a huge challenge to change that. But I don't think it has to do with 72 percent of Israelis not wanting a two state solution. I think a lot of that is people who have been led to believe that it doesn't matter. And why should they think it's important if their government never uh, handles it, and if they're told that you know going into Gaza every other summer or sometimes more often 
um, is just sort of uh, uh, something that fell on us from the heavens. So I don't think it really reflects how Israelis uh, feel. Um, B, um, as far as hope goes, um, we're, we're going to win this. Um, we, we just are. Um, because there's no other choice and we're Israeli. So the whole sort of Polish, you know, we're not so nice. We're not so polite. We don't take no for an answer. We're not very good at standing in lines. We break protocol. Okay, there are advantages and disadvantages. When it comes to this fight, it's a big advantage. The, the, the level of creativity and devotion and determination and tenacity that you see here is amazing. And we are also, by the way, in touch with people from Poland. I just met with a, an EU representative who was visiting here in Israel and she's from Poland and she was one of the leaders 10 years ago. We are constantly getting advice and we're constantly hearing from people in other places that we're doing something right, okay? And also, by the way, from people who research uh, uh, struggle and, and pro-democracy uh, um, movements around the world. Uh, and, and we're constantly learning and constantly improving. Um, and so, and, and Mika, know, Mika you, know what, you know what I heard yeah, uh, lately? That uh, uh, we, I mean, we started the country by exporting uh, oranges, then we moved to high tech, and now we're exporting pro-democracy. Uh, yeah. So uh, it, it's, I mean, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I mean, like you see, I, I actually just, I think, so uh, a, a campaign, uh, I think of Lincoln Project of Reclaim the Flag, right? Ah. Which is, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Reclaim the That's Flag. That's ours. That's, That's ours. ours. That's ours. We will be expecting a small percentage <laughs> of, uh, of the success. <laughs> Um, well, really, just, you know, uh, just symbolic. Not. I want to bring us to to a close by just reaffirming that uh, J Street uh, imported uh, your export, and we added pro democracy to our tagline uh, last fall. And uh, it is absolutely a, an honor of J Streets to be a partner with the protest movement, to be a partner with Unacceptable. Uh, it's important that there be a broad tent, and obviously. J Street is going to always maintain a focus on occupation and the belief that you cannot have democracy with occupation and that it is integral to Israel's democratic future to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We will maintain that belief and we will remain vocal and outspoken about that in the midst of this, but you have to build a broad, broad tent and save uh, Israel's democracy with the allies that we can build that coalition with. And so we're very supportive of you. Uh, we thank you for your time. Uh, Ophir, I will see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. I have one more one more hope sentence, which is uh -huh. that I honestly believe that as you know the as as great as as this crisis is, the opportunity is even greater because you know our our ambition at the end is not to go back. It's to, to move forward. And this is a real opportunity for tikkun, you know, for tikkun in Israel and tikkun yeah. olam. Absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful words to end on. I thank you both for your time. Now go back thank to your Thank you, protest. everybody. I'm going to go <laughs> All right. uh, Bye. Make some more noise See you soon. Now. Thank yeah. you, everybody, Bye -bye. for joining us. Thanks, Jeremy.